Hi everybody, my name is William E. Harlan, otherwise known as Billy, and I'm going to read you from my book, Antioch, The Circle, Part 1. Chapter 1. Paladin. Ares complained when Michael reined him in. The white stallion neighed and stamped, water bursting from the cobblestones of his hooves. He made a deafening clatter. Michael steadied in the saddle, searching the cottages up ahead. He'd ridden through a terrible storm, hoping to arrive before the plague, but the old coastal town of Moreau was as still and quiet as a graveyard. Then, drawn out by the sound of Michael's mount, a shadow of life emerged from between the buildings. The shade limped toward horse and rider in a slow, determined line. More of its kind followed out of the alleys, doorways, and broken windows of the broken town. They lurched and crawled like injured soldiers, and they smelled like rotten corpses on the wind. Michael stopped counting heads at twenty-four, with still more of them coming. He'd have to cut them all down before he could start looking for survivors. He swung over to dismount landing with a muffled clink of heavy chainmail and leather armor, and then from Ares' flank took his weapon, a huge sword sheathed in lacquered ash, his caligan. Its wide double edge glinted as it slid from its scabbard's throat. In the ancient and sacred script of Michael's order, the circle, four vows etched the caligan's fuller, silence, obedience, chastity, and poverty. Five and a half feet from point to pommel, the handle almost as long as the blade, it weighed thirteen cleaving pounds of steel. It was a devil slayer's weapon, built for slaughter more than swordsmanship. Michael placed its polished case on the cobblestones and stepped away to wait for the coming of Moreau's dead. He would face them out there on the road to avoid attracting any more than his horse already had. Ares trotted off into the vast coastal heath. They came silently except for the brush of their decaying flesh and clothes. The nearest reached out for Michael, despite the distance, grasping for him desperately with its left hand. Its right arm had been torn out of the socket. Its skin was a pallid bag, swinging loose over the bones and muscles underneath. Smoke trailed gray out of its slack mouth, like it had a coal fire in its chest, and its eyes glittered like black glass. Michael raised his weapon and waited. Then, concentrating, he opened the way out of the world. A power he knew as Rin, something natural to all living things, blasted into his body in an unnatural amount, giving him unnatural strength enough to send his heavy edge through a ten-inch pine in one stroke. The ghoul came right at him. Michael struck and split it from collar to hip with the short sound of a butcher at the block. Whock! Its head and shoulders spun away, spraying a strange black ink from its spine. Gray clouds rolled out of its opened lungs. Its greater half was a stumbling fountain. Michael held his breath. The ghoul's smoke seared into his eyes as it flowed over him. It was a contagion, the most rapacious by far he'd ever felt and it took burning root in any opening of the skin. Even so, Rin gave Michael more than strength. It healed and drove affliction from the body, glowing with a brilliant, orous light wherever it did so. His eyes started to blaze like golden gateways to another realm. Michael strode to the next ghoul and cut it in half with an upward stroke that mirrored his first. Again and again his caligan passed in swift, unbroken arcs through their fetid flesh and bone. Again and again and again until corpses littered the path in piles, spilling their disease into the air and their ink onto the stones. The wind above the road became a river of smoke. Michael stepped out of it into the tall, wet heath to breathe. The ink marred his habit by then, having splashed across his high-collared white tabard and the golden circle embroidered at his chest. It was dirty work. He noticed a ghoul harassing his horse nearby and turned to watch, concerned. It was no more than a clumsy child to the mighty Ares, though. He scooted away with an irritated snort and a short burst of speed. It persisted, pawing once again at the horse's brawny haunches and causing another brief dash. Then, the third time it came up behind him, Ares lost patience and kicked it in the groin. The ghoul left its feet, rotating through the air, ejecting feculence. Michael was reassured, but he'd also been distracted. A one-eyed legless fiend had crawled on its belly through the mud, reached up its flayed hand from the weeds, and grabbed him. He looked down just as it was lifting its mouth to his leg. He blurted out, God's mercy, and hopped away on one foot, trying to kick out of its grip. It was surprisingly strong. In that moment, in that brief lapse of awareness, Michael backed right into the full mass of the others. His strength was no match for their overwhelming numbers. They dragged him down, burying him in their writhing grasp. Though protected by his thick leather gauntlets, he yanked his fingers away from the crushing pressure of their teeth. He dropped his sword. Their bites could not break his mail, but still pinched and ripped his skin within the links. 
In the darkness of the squelching heat, Michael's glowing eyes lit a crooked face that gnashed and snapped just inches from his own, held back only by the selfish effort of the others. Out on the heath, a peaceful sea breeze flowed over the low green leaves and tussled Ares' mane. He tossed his head and stamped the earth like a playful cloud that had left the wide blue sky to take conquering form on the ground. He worried over nothing. The ghoul he'd kicked dragged its shattered hips through the bushes somewhere. Under the weight of the pile, Michael's chest felt about to collapse. His lungs seized and threatened to breathe as blind, disintegrating fingers groped his head. He wasn't finished yet, though. He shoved and wormed, pushing with his elbows and heels into the mud until he could turn. Then he wrenched onto his stomach and scrambled out of the mound. Michael ran until the light left his eyes, then he gasped for air. Though he could heal the infection, he still needed to breathe, and he couldn't do that if the smoke clogged his lungs. The air was sweet. Any air was better than none, but he'd been in the ghoul's stink for so long he couldn't smell it anymore. Behind him, they crawled over each other in slow pursuit. He wanted to lead them away from there. He started jogging through the muddy grass. Ares clopped up beside him, easily matching the man's speed, and, seeing the running as a game, gave him a little bump. That was how Ares liked to play. Michael didn't see it coming and got knocked flat in his face into the mud again. He jumped up furious, slinging filth and shouting, No! Bad! That's a bad horse, Ares! Go away! The animal obeyed, pitching up turf in a sprint. Michael cast an angry glance back at the ghouls. They were far behind. He resumed his long, circular path, returning to where they'd brought him down. Once there, he searched the flattened plants for his sword and found it reflecting the sun. With his Caligan's weight in hand again, Michael met the gang of ghouls and gave ground swinging like a reaper. Rotten limbs and pieces shot from his humming blade's path. He moved in a backward circle, keeping them in the sword's arc until none of them was capable of following him. Then he retraced his steps and destroyed the ones he'd merely crippled making sure to bleed the ink out of their spines. The road was a line of pebbled mortar in the wild, worn more by weather than use. Smoke still spilled sideways from the corpses farther south when Michael returned from the heath. His scabbard's bright polish and steel were in stark contrast with the rest of him then. His once white tabard, with its high collar and golden embroidery, was a pair of torn and gore-soaked rat tails dripping under the front and back of his belt. A jigsaw of cracking mud plates coated his mail, and his caligan glistened with the ghoul's ink. He tried cleaning the blade with his filthy garment, and then on the muddy grass beside the road, but merely traded muck for muck. Refusing to put the sword into its case that way, he left it unsheathed. A rustling in the heath caught his attention. The one-eyed legless fiend had found him again, that half of a ghoul that had caused him so much trouble. Slower than the others, it had survived the greater destruction, and was scrabbling onto the road by itself. Michael narrowed his eyes on it and stepped forward. Then he raised his heavy boot and stomped the ghoul's head into the cobblestones. It splattered like a black-gut walnut under a hammer, and the corpse went still. Michael stood there examining it, imagining that monster's final moments as a man. What horrors he must have gone through before the plague had claimed him. Out of respect for the dead, Michael put down his weapon and knelt. It had been more than thirty years since he'd last prayed. He didn't know if it would make a difference. But there was something his father always said at funerals that seemed right to say. He mouthed the words first, assembling them from his memory. Please, God, allow these souls peace and rest. By your side, in your light. Amen. Ares snorted. Michael looked at him, thinking about the way forward. The town's narrow lanes would be filled with restless dead. Though unthreatened out in the open, his proud white stallion could be cornered and overwhelmed in there. Michael went to him, unbuckled the saddle's girth, and left Ares unbridled. The horse could find his way home. Then, picking up his caligan again and almost sheathing it before he caught himself, Michael walked into Moreau. That is the end of Chapter 1. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can follow the link at the top of my website, www.williameharlan.com, and purchase the full novel from Amazon in ebook format for $2.99 or as a paperback for $12.99. Thanks for listening. And please tune in next week for Chapter 2, Homestead.